Exclusive sexual reproduction is a widespread characteristic of animal life, despite its high cost to individual fitness. Instead of simply copying itself, an organism that is very well adapted to its environment invests significant resources in finding a mate and then throws its genes in a 50-50 lottery when reproducing sexually. This invariably results in offspring less adapted to the environment. Aging is another widespread characteristic of animal life that has a high individual fitness cost. Like sexual reproduction, aging was selected for as a means of population control. This is the demographic theory of aging, and our next speaker, Josh Middledorf, is one of the foremost experts in this theory. So it's a real honor for me to be here. Thanks to David for inviting me. And uh, I was actually flat on my back when I received this invitation. And I took a chance that I'd be walking again by the time I got to here. So I got my PhD in astrophysics in the 1980s and wrote software for 10 years. And then I saw this article in Scientific American in 1996 that said caloric restriction increases longevity dramatically in a wide variety of organisms. This is the first time I'd heard of that. And it just got me thinking. Um, first, that because this is in a, a wide variety of organisms, it must be an evolutionary adaptation, which is broadly based. You know, what do mice and flies have in common that they should have evolved the same adaptation? And the second thing that I realized from this is that aging must be programmed. If you ask why does animals live longer when calorically restricted, you get confused. But if you ask why do animals live shorter when they have plenty of food to eat, that's a really clear and compelling question. There's nothing you can do when you're starved that you couldn't also do if there's plenty of food available. So that means that aging is voluntary, that the body wants to age. And that was my reasoning. Um, in the days before there was uh, the World Wide Web, there was still an internet there was a, an email group of evolutionary biologists. I sent this, my theory of programmed aging out to 1,000 evolutionary biologists. And people, there was no spam in those days. So I got back lots of answers. And people said, you're all wrong. You don't understand how evolution works. Read George Williams's book, Adaptation and Natural Selection. This requires group selection. Group selection isn't a thing. I didn't know anything about group selection. I didn't know anything about George Williams. But this was a real challenge. I spent a year. I went to, um, I took courses at University of Pennsylvania near my home in evolutionary biology. You know, I wanted to figure out, uh, is what they're saying to me sensible? Or do I have, uh, am I seeing something that they're not seeing about aging being an adaptation? And at the end of a year, I realized it's both. And this is, a, this is a conundrum. On the one hand, you can prove using the standard methods of evolutionary biology, population genetics, or the selfish gene theory is the way it's popularly known. You can prove that um, aging cannot be an adaptation. And on the other hand, you have all this evidence from the phenomenology of aging that aging is an adaptation. And I took this as a challenge. I'm a computer programmer, computer modeler. How can I get the modeling to work to create uh, a model in which aging 
emerges as an adaptation. So let's see. Here are some other reasons besides the caloric restriction argument that I, I just outlined why we know that aging must be an adaptation. First, there's a conserved evolutionary basis, which means that the genes that control aging in you are the same as the genes that control aging in worms and flies. Um, there's the insulin pathway. We think of insulin as regulating blood sugar, but worms have an insulin receptor. It's called DAF2, and you modulate DAF2, and the worms live twice as long. Yeast have an insulin receptor. They don't have any circulating blood or blood sugar, but they had insulin as a regulator of aging a billion years before there were um, mammals. Half a billion years before there were mammals. Um, so insulin has been a regulator of aging for half a billion years. There are lots of genes that are conserved between yeast and mammals. So it's not unique, but all of them have some essential function. They're not just junk that happens to appear along the way. Those genes don't get conserved. If you have a conserved gene, it must be important to evolution. And what this means to me is that aging serves an essential function in, uh, in natural selection somehow. Um, gene expression changes over the lifetime. Uh, you'd expect while the body is more damaged in old age that the protective medicine mechanisms would be turned on. They're not, they're turned off. And inflammation, which is killing the body, gets ramped up in old age. This again indicates that this is on purpose. It's not an accident. There are genes in worms that were discovered by uh, Tom Johnson in the 80s and more by Cynthia Kenyon in the 90s. You just eliminate the gene and the animal lives longer. So what is this if it's not an aging gene? And what is the aging gene doing there? Um, and finally, there are examples of programmed aging in nature that are just undeniable. Um, apoptosis was always thought to be well, the cell sacrificing itself for the sake of the body. But in the 1990s, again, Walter Longo discovered that yeast cells, individual yeast cells, will undergo apoptosis, programmed cell death. Um, and it, it took him a decade to get it. This is his PhD thesis. It took him a decade to get it published because nobody believed that this could possibly be true. Um, telomere attrition is a form of aging that affects ciliates, um, paramecia, and like one-celled animals. Um, and then, of course, there's semel parity, programmed death right after reproduction, which is in some salmon, in uh, many plants, annual plants, and in octopuses. Um, so, I had, uh, I saw clearly that there's a contradiction between what we observe in the phenomenology of aging and the way evolution is thought to work in the community. I took on this challenge and that's how I got into the field, was trying to, to solve this conundrum. Uh, the solution came to me when my mentor, David Wilson, said, you've got to read uh, Michael Gilpin. Michael Gilpin, 30 years before me, had realized that there's one situation in which group selection can overcome individual selection easily, and that's in predator-prey communities. If you have a shared predator, a shared prey pool by a predator community, um, you can't afford to maximize your fitness by um, eating as much as you can and reproducing as much as possible because your children starve. As soon as your genes come to dominate the, um, 
the gene pool, then the, the prey get all eaten up and the children starve, and this is extinction. And extinction is a powerful driving force in natural selection. And you know, 30 years before me, uh, Gilpin published this book, and he'd laid the groundwork. And it was after I read that that I understood, of course. And that's why programmed aging is so common in animals, and it's much more, much less in plants. So we speak of predators as anything that relies on a food source, not necessarily an animal food source. So in the, in the lingo of ecology, uh, even vegetarians are predators. The, the cows can't afford to eat up all the grass any more than the lions can afford to eat up all the elk. So th this, was the, uh, th this was the thing that, that convinced me that um, I now understood the evolution of aging. So this has deep implications for how evolution works. The selfish gene paradigm is really just a small part of the story because predator-prey interactions opens up the community to a whole range of ecological interactions which are evolved at the community level. But it also has implications for anti-aging medicine. If you believe that the body is fighting as hard as it can to prevent aging and things just go wrong, then you're stuck trying to correct all those problems that evolution has been unable to correct for a billion years. We're trying to fix them one at a time. This is a tough, tough problem. But if you think that the, age, the body is programmed to age, then there's a clock inside. We need access to that clock. It's a biochemical clock, or it's, it consists of hormones. And if we can tamper with that clock, then we've got the royal road to anti-aging. And um, so I was telling David just before this conference, money has poured into this field in the last 10 years. And the vast majority of it is going into the biochemistry of aging at the cell level. They don't realize that that's not the way to do it. The way to do it is to look at the whole organism and signaling in the organism. Aging is controlled centrally, and when we control signaling in the body, then we will defeat aging. Um, I, I think it's a fool's errand to try to control aging at the cellular level. How does the body know how old it is? So for most people who study aging as um, things that go wrong with the body. This doesn't make any sense at all to even ask this question. What do you mean, how does the body know how old it is? Does the car know how old it is? Uh, no, the car just deteriorates. And you can set the odometer back in the car. That's the car's record of how old it is. But you don't expect that setting the odometer back is going to make the car actually perform better. But setting the methylation clock back, we do expect that it's going to um, imply that the body acts younger and lives longer. So I've been at the forefront of this idea of programmed aging for in this whole second lifetime of my career. Um, and so I owe it to you to produce a clock. If the body is, as I say, programmed to die, there must be some way that the body knows how old it is and communicates this through the biochemistry to create programs of self-destruction and turning off the programs of protection. So we know that there's a biological clock because we have circadian rhythms. We know that there's a biological clock because you have all your growth hormones turned on the moment you pop out of the womb, and they're turned off gradually through growth. Uh, this, the time of growth. You know that your sex hormones get turned on at a specific age. So the body does know how old it is. It's true. It's, uh, it's uncontroversial that, that there are these clocks, even though they're not well characterized. Um, the thing that, uh, that I'm saying which is different is that the clocks continue. The aging clock is a continuation of the developmental clock from a stage that promotes individual fitness, Darwinian fitness, 
to a stage that promotes self-destruction at the expense of individual fitness. And that's what's really so controversial. Uh, I want to distinguish between two different functions of a clock. A clock has to have a timekeeper, that's the pendulum, and it has to have a clock face, which reads out how, so that it counts the pendulum ticks and so that we can look at it and know how old. And both these functions must be in the body, and to, to some extent they're separable, and I'll be talking about the, the separation. Candidates. Uh, plausible candidates for what may be the uh, aging clocks in the body. There are five that I'm going to talk about. Telomere attrition was the sort of the first out of the stall and it was very popular to talk about it 10 or 20 years ago. Thymic involution has been pushed by one, uh, one man in particular, a friend of mine, um, the best candidate for a centralized clock is the hypothalamus and the superchiasmatic nucleus, which is part of the hypothalamus, which we know has timekeeping functions and we know has neuroendocrine functions, which are powerful through the body. Then there's the proteome in the blood. The, the second best clocks, besides methylation, are based on uh, looking at the proteome in the blood in the same way that uh, Horvath looked at methylation patterns associated with age. Le Hallier, just a few years ago, came out with a paper looking at proteomic patterns in the blood. And of course, there's the methylation state, which carries a record of what proteins are being produced uh, through the body, and uh, to what extent is that either a clock face or a clock pendulum or both. So these are the five I'm going to talk about in the next few minutes. Telomere attrition. So you, you probably know the basics. Telomeres are end caps on the chromosome, and each time the cell divides, the end cap gets a little bit shorter, and eventually the cell suffers senescence. It no longer, be, no longer is functional. This was discovered by Len Hayflick in the 1960s, and Michael Fossil wrote a popular book in the 1990s saying this has a lot to do with human aging. Um, Bill Andrews started a company screening compounds for uh, their ability to extend telomeres, which I, I think has gone, I don't know, I, I think he's still looking to get that company off the ground. The function of telomere attrition is really a connection with aging that goes way back to the earliest eukaryotes. This is a paramecium, and paramecia suffer through, suffer aging through telomere attrition. They, telomerase is what makes the telomere long, and each time the, the uh, paramecium divides, it loses a little bit of telomere length until it's going to become senescent. What, how does it ever uh, obtain the ability to continue going for a longer time? It has to conjugate. Conjugate is the um, prokaryotes, no, the, the early eukaryotes version of sex. This paramecium will sidle up to another, eukary another paramecium. They'll exchange genetic material. They'll exchange cytoplasm. And they separate, and the two cells that separate are no longer A and B. Each one is half A and half B. So it's combining the genomes and combining the metabolisms of the two. This is the earliest form of sex. Well, maybe there's sex in bacteria too, but it's very different. This is this, the earliest eukaryotic form of sex. And look at that. It's tied to aging. The Paramecia gets older every time it reproduces, and its clock is reset to zero when it conjugates with another paramecium. It's a great story that I, I love to tell. I learned about it from William Clark, who wrote books about this maybe 20 years ago, a UCLA professor. 
Um, so I was enthusiastic about, oh, oh, I forgot to tell you about Cawthon. So um, Richard Cawthon did a study in, I think, 2002 or 2003, in which he looked at telomere length in a historic blood sample and found that telomere length predicted quite uh, with, with a strong correlation, who was going to die early. So short telomeres were associated with sh shorter life expectancy of people at, at the same age. And this really put the subject on the map in the early 2000s. And that was really the state of the art until a study came out six years ago, I think, a Danish study where they looked at the telomeres of 64,000 people in uh, Copenhagen and if you plot telomere length versus age, average telomere length versus age, you get this very fat cigar. And this was discouraging to me. When I saw, saw this, I said, you know, telomeres can't be as important as I have been saying. Because look at this. There are people who are uh, 18 years old who actually have much shorter telomeres than the average 90-year-old, and obviously they don't have shorter life expectancies than the average life. This, this um, cigar is too fat, to, um, and that's a, a problem for the telomere theory. But there's still a plausible version of the telomere clock, and that is that the average telomere length isn't what matters. What matters is the shortest telomeres not being measured here. It's the cells that run out of telomere, the few cells, the minority that are on the tail end of the distribution, they run out of telomere, they become senescent cells, and they undergo what's called SASP, senescent associated secretory phenotype. It was named by Judy Campisi, who discovered it 10 or 15 years ago. These cells turn toxic. They're poisoning the body, and it's the cells with the shortest telomeres that matter. The average telomere doesn't matter so much. So uh, a few years after that, Jan van Dersen, a researcher at Mayo Clinic, uh, came out with a study where he, he did some fancy biochemistry and he genetically engineered mice so he could turn on and off a kill switch just for the senescent cells. And by comparing the animals in which he'd killed the senescent cells to animals in which he didn't kill the senescent cells, the just killing the senescent cells, the males live 30% longer, the females live 20% longer in this experiment. Just striking. I mean, he started with animals that were already quite well along the way. Uh, so ever since then, people have been less interested in extending telomeres and more interested in what's called senolytics. Senolytics is a treatment that will kill your senescent cells but leave your healthy cells alone. And it's the holy grail to get a high enough ratio between the toxicity to senescent cells and the toxicity to normal cells that you can actually take this drug without it damaging you. Uh, we're working on it. But there are candidates. Uh, the, the most popular is a combination of either quercetin or fisetin with the chemotherapy drug called desatinib. I'm going to move on now from telomeres to the second candidate clock, thymic involution. We each have a thymus. It's somewhere in here, it's about as big as your thumb when you're 10 years old and it gets smaller and less functional for the rest of your life. So all of us have been losing the th thymus gradually for quite a while. I don't see any people under 10 audience. So when the thymus, what's the function of the thymus? The T cells, the, um, a subset of the white cells in the body that go out and attack invaders, they have to learn, this is self, protect that. This is not self, go attack it. 
and that training is done in the thymus. That's why they're called T cells. And as those cells are not trained as well, we get type 1 and type 2 errors late in life. Uh, both the T cells fail to recognize invaders, so our we immune system weakens, and the T cells turn on healthy cells in the body, which is called autoimmunity, and it's the basis for partially the basis for diabetes and uh, a lot the basis for arthritis. Some of the diseases of old age are associated with, old, with autoimmunity and therefore with thymic involution. The person who's um, done the most to, to popularize this theory of aging is Greg Fay. Um, he's a, a longtime friend of mine because he believes in programmed aging. And we, we get together early, this group of people who re recognize that aging is programmed. So he did a little experiment on himself in the early 2000s. Finally, in 2018, he had the funding to do a pilot study with nine people. Nine people studied very intentionally. So they were all male. Um, he gave them a combination of these five ingredients. HGH is supposed to be the payload. HGH grows the thymus back. Uh, and the rest are to, in some way, compensate the bad effects of HGH, because we know that HGH is actually associated with lower lifespan if, if you take it chronically. So the DHEA metformin, um, metformin is because HGH can indu induce diabetes. Vitamin D and zinc were also part of this protocol. And remarkably, at the end of a year program, uh, the average methylation age by the Horvath clock, by several different Horvath clocks, was a year younger, not a year older. So there was a two-year two difference. This paper came out two years ago. Um, and it was the first time that the Horvath clock had been set back to an early age, earlier age. And uh, it's, it's very promising research. And you think about it, it's remarkable that there's no obvious way that uh, regrowing the thymus, we, we don't know of any direct interaction between the thymus and methylation. So th there must be some deep, intricate biochemistry involved if regrowing your thymus can, uh, can set your aging clock lower. And we don't know. I mean, there's a follow-on study now called TRIM2 uh, where they're going to find out, is it the, D the thymus or is it these other ingredients? Vitamin D and DHEA, I think, are, have substantial possibility of being life extension hormones in their own right. So maybe there's something more complicated here than just regrowing the thymus. And we're going to learn something about that over the next few years. So moving from the thymus to the brain, this is, as I said, the best candidate we have for a central clock that controls aging. The hypothalamus is uh, sort of highlighted here. Oh. And the suprachiasmatic nucleus is a part of the hypothalamus that we know is connected to circadian rhythms. And there are all kinds of reasons, little hints to think that the hypothalamus is the locus of a clock that controls aging centrally in the body. Um, some of the best work on this has been done by um, Dongsheng Tsai at Einstein University in New York. And he's transplanted a tissue from an, a young mouse hypothalamus into an old mouse hypothalamus and found that the, the animals live longer. He's looked at the microRNAs that come out of the hypothalamus in uh, little 
um, packets. Which I'm blanking on the name of for the moment. That um, that he, he believes, based on his experiments, have, are a, a driving force. That uh, it's the microRNAs that come out of the hypothalamus that keep us young, and the the hypothalamus becomes inflamed later in life. So so we think of inflammation as downstream damage, but in the hypothalamus. Inflammation actually has a signaling role. The inflammation level of the hypothalamus looks like it's controlling what hormones come out of the hypothalamus, and therefore it has all kinds of downstream effects from that. So looking at inflammation locally and the hypothalamus seems to be important. NF-kappa B is a uh, is a secretion that comes from the hypothalamus, and we know that that's an upstream cause of inflammation. There's um, GnRH, gonadotropin-releasing hormone, which also comes from the hypothalamus. It controls, uh, it's a master switch for sex hormones, and again, it's been linked to aging. There's a neurotransmitter called orexin, O-R-E-X-I-N, that comes from the hypothalamus. And it's part of the waking-sleeping cycle. So it's, again, on a clock. And it's been associated with aging. And we know that people whose circadian rhythm is disrupted by um, jobs, by shift work that's constantly changing their, their schedule. Uh, they have sh substantially shortened lifespan. And experiments have done, been done with flies where they change the clock length of a day for the fly by turning the lights on and off at different times. And either a shorter or a longer day than 24 hours tends to make the, the flies live shorter lives. Uh, let's see. The hippocampus is, I think, below here. See it. Oh, here it is. No. The hippocampus is, is a, another uh, neuroendocrine organ that's associated with secretions that affect lifespan. TGF beta is, uh, is a strong candidate. It's, there are s several kinds of TGF beta. And one of them is called GDF11. It was studied by Amy Wagers at Harvard and promoted, oh, this is the key to longevity. And there was promise about that maybe six or seven years ago. And then the data came in that said, no, GDF11 doesn't do what we think it does. In fact, we have less. We have more GDF11 late in life, and it's doing damage. So that whole story remains to be sorted out. But TGF beta is known to be a promoter of inflammation, and it comes from the hippocampus, another neuroendocrine organ. So putting all this together, we know that aging is regulated in an active way, that it depends on the environment, it depends on how you live and what you do. And the fact that we need the brain to do calculations and the endocrine system to send out the result of those calculations and signals to the body about its age really makes this part of the brain, the neuroendocrine part of the brain, a prime candidate if you're looking for a centralized clock to control aging. The, there isn't nearly enough research being done in this area. The two luminaries are Claudia Cavadas, Cavadas at, in Portugal at the University of Coimbra. Uh, who studied neuropeptide Y, another, uh, another neuropeptide that comes out of the hypothalamus and seems to be associated with increased lifespan. You can increase lifespan by introducing neuropeptide Y. You can't eat it. You can't inject it. How are you going to get it into the brain? So 
once we discover, once we realize that the brain is programming the age state of the body, it's a whole other problem to think, well, how are you going to get in there to modify the, the brain and to reset the clock? But I think it's a promising field of research. And as I say, Claudia Cavadas and Dong Sheng Tsai, two opposite ends of the globe, are doing the most uh, promising research in this field. I'd love to see more people get into it. Next is the plasma proteome. This is uh, a plot from a paper that came out a couple of years ago by Lahalier, who I, I mentioned, um, correlating the proteome in the bloodstream. There, there are thousands of signal proteins that are included in blood plasma. And sorting out which of them make us younger, which of them make us older, is a, is a deep and um, difficult problem. Um, this subject got its start when a group of researchers at Stanford working with um, Tom Rando at Stanford in the early 2000s tied two mice together so that they shared one circulatory system. It's called heterochronic parabiosis when you tie a, an old mice mouse to a young mouse. And you can't do lifespan studies because they don't live very long when, uh, when they're tied together. But you can see from the biochemistry and from the ability to heal that the young mice gets older and the old mouse gets younger just from sharing the same circulatory system. And this research has continued now for 15 more years at Harvard, at Berkeley, and at Stanford. The, my favorite people are the convoys, Mike and Arena Convoy at Berkeley, who've come out with the theory that um, it's the bad molecules that you need to remove that are doing the most to promote aging. And they say you can get younger just by diluting the blood. There's a, a doctor named Dobri Kiprof in the Bay Area, Palo Alto, I think, who's uh, doing a clinical trial now where he does plasma phoresis. You, you remove somebody's blood, centrifuge it so that the blood cells go to one end and the plasma goes to the other end. You can put back the cells into the body, put back your own cells, but much less of the plasma, and replace the plasma with saline and with um, with albumin, which is uh, sort of the largest part of the protein in the blood and not connected to aging. So you replace the you dilute the plasma with saline and albumin. And there's promise that the convoys and this Dr. Kiprof think that uh, there's going to be rejuvenation value in that. Um, meanwhile, there are people who say, no, no, it's not what you take out. It's what you put back in that controls aging. We need more of the good stuff, not less of the bad stuff. And researchers at um, Stanford are pushing that idea led by Tony weiss Corre, who has a company um, that's experimenting with factors from young blood introduced into old people. So I want to talk next about the work of Harold Katcher. How many of you have heard of Katcher in his work? Is, it, is this completely new to you? Good. <laughs> I can tell you something you don't already know. So Harold Katcher is a friend of mine because he's one of these small group of people who recognized early that aging is programmed. And he's an amateur in, only in the sense that uh, he has no large budget. He doesn't have a university laboratory of his own. Um, but he had, he's, had a, he's 78 years old, retired from a moderately successful career as a biochemist. 
Five years ago, he found an Indian entrepreneur who was willing to fund some basic research into his idea. So, so let's see. Going back a little bit, Katya saw this data about parabiosis, and he had an idea about what the elements in the blood that are important are. And he wanted to, to do the experiments to see if this is going to work. He got an investor from India who flew him to Bombay for a year. Mumbai, I guess it's called now. So he worked in Mumbai where the regulation is lax and where the costs are lower. And at the end of just a year, he had taken two-year-old rats and turned them into one-year-old rats. Um, they have better cognitive abilities, better grip strength. They look better. They look younger. And um, after a year, he convinced Horvath, the king of aging clocks, to develop a special methylation test specialized to rats. And uh, two years ago, this month, a paper came out by Catcher and Horvath together that demonstrated that these rats that had been rejuvenated with a treatment Catcher calls E5, we don't know what's in it, but it's derived from the blood of, uh, of younger rats, that they had half the age, that, that he was making two-year-old rats into one-year-old rats, and according to the Horvath clock. Uh, I was very impressed about with this work, and I wrote it up prominently in my blog. Um, and there's a paper online with pre preliminary results. It hasn't received the attention that I think it deserves. <sighs> so the sad part of this story is that Catcher is associated, he's, he's in hock to this um, Indian entrepreneur who has all the, I'm, I'm being recorded. I'll say what I really believe. Um, I, I think the entrepreneur has damaged the, the, the program. We need a broad research program based on what he calls E5. And uh, the entrepreneur wants to make money, wants to keep it secret. We don't know what's in E5 yet. And there aren't labs around the world that are extending this work and reproducing it, as there would be if he made the contents public. I believe that that two years too late, not too late, but two years later, it's about to be announced as their patent on E5 is unsealed in July. And they have a contract with Johns Hopkins University, where at least one research group is going to be varying this protocol. I mean, once you have this dramatic result, there's a lot to be done with tinkering with it, uh, the ratios of the different components, what age do you give it to them. Uh, male and female rats seems to be an issue. Dosage seems to be an issue. What, we need extensive research in this field, and it's being held up uh, by the guy who has the intellectual property rights. So moving on, the last item on my list is the methylation state of the body. And it's easy to imagine that the methylation state of the body is a clock face in that it's reading out which proteins get produced and sent into, sent into the bloodstream. It's harder to imagine that there's a pendulum associated with it. It's, it's not a timekeeping mechanism. But maybe the methylation state of the body is part of how the body knows how old it is. Um, methylation is just one of, as I said, 100 different known mechanisms of epigenetic control, controlling which genes get expressed. And it's the one we know about because there's a cheap test that uh, can measure methylation over, over the, a, a broad sample within the genome. Methylation occurs at short time scales of minutes and also at very long time scales of generations. 
because when a cell divides and the DNA replicates, these CPG regions uh, get copied. So you've got CG, CG, CG. You don't have CC, CC, CG, G, 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 G. Why is that? It's because these CPG regions, when go through a, a post, uh, post mitotic stage where the uh, uh, an enzyme crawls over the DNA, looks for these CPG regions, CG, 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 which is methylated on one side, the C's, but not on the other side. The, the, the CG, CG, CG side is methylated, but the G, C, G, C, G side isn't, and it will go and methylate that side. So uh, methylation patterns survive cell replication. They also survive through generations of um, giving birth. Uh, I guess the, the record is that they followed methylation patterns for six generations, doing um, stress tests on the, uh, stressing a mouse, causing a particular methylation pattern and finding that same methylation pattern and the offspring of the mouse and the offspring of the offspring down to six generations as far as they've looked. So methylation can be very persistent. It can also be um, changed in a few minutes. The biochemistry of methylation is amazingly complex. We're just beginning to understand it. But perhaps methylation is uh, a key to how the body knows how old it is. So beyond this, I ask whether there's a, a pendulum associated with the clock and not just a clock face. You have a feedback loop. The proteome in the bloodstream is actually produced by the dispersed cells in the body that are spewing out these chemicals into the blood. And the methylome is what determines which the methylome determines which proteins get produced and sent whoop, and sent into the uh, proteome. But on, on the other hand, part of the proteome is transcription factors which go back into the cells and they program methylation and they program other aspects of epigenetic control. So there's this feedback loop. Whenever you have a feedback loop, you have the possibility of a clock. And I wonder, I, I consider it an open question, whether there is an, a, a timekeeping mechanism associated with this feedback loop, the methyl methylome in the dispersed cells and the proteome in the bloodstream. Uh, it's, a, it's an interesting and open question. So whether the proteome is, uh, we have lots of good reasons to think that the proteome, that lowering your methylation age actually makes you live longer. But there are reasons to suspect it as well. And I, you know, I, was, just, I was shocked just a couple of months ago when Morgan Levine, a luminary in this field, who's come out with, I think, the two best clocks that we have. She was a student uh, a few years ago in Horvath's lab. She now has a lab of her own at Yale. She's come out with very innovative work in uh, producing methylation clocks. And she doesn't believe in programmed aging. And she doesn't believe that reducing your methylation age is going to actually make you live longer. So I've had this discussion with her. It's deeply disturbing to me. Um, but maybe she's right. There are many questions that remain to be answered. And I just hope that I'm leaving you with more questions than answers. There's lots to be, lots to be done in this field. It's just wide open. I, I think there are going to be um, big discoveries just in the next few years. And hope you all participate in that. OK, thank you for speaking. Let's all thank our speaker. Replicative life has the fundamental problem of exponential population growth. 
Aging is the result of self-destruction programs built into organisms to mitigate this problem. If there were just a single biological pathway causing aging, mutations in this pathway would have been selected for, and exponential population growth would not have been mitigated. Thus, there must be multiple pathways simultaneously increasing the probability of death of an organism, just as there are multiple pathways simultaneously maintaining a cell's genomic integrity. There have already been numerous interventions in many of the aging pathways. We should only expect significant life extension when numerous pathways are interfered with at once. Aging research is already on the verge of combining numerous interventions. And thus, if aging research is prioritized appropriately, aging will be cured in our lifetimes.